Let's talk about the Nikon F3. When this came out in 1980, it would have cost over a thousand dollars. It was a top of the line camera. Yeah, I bought it about 10 years ago with lens for 50 quid. Now it has gone up a bit since then, uh, but even a hundred pounds is a steal for what is an amazing camera. It looks a lot like a chunky 35 millimeter SLR, and it is, but the gimmick with the F3 is that they tried to make it a system camera. That is, they took the modular assembly format of much bigger cameras, like a Hasselblad, and they shrunk it all down into this tiny format. Is it useful for photography? Not really. I love how much control you have, but it's exceedingly rare that I feel the need to, say, hot swap my focus screen out in the field. However, if you want to learn about cameras and how they work, the F3 is perfect. The whole point of an SLR is that what you see through the viewfinder is as close as possible, exactly what ends up on the film. Now, in the age of digital cameras with live view, that might not seem like a big deal, but in film photography, it was everything. Cameras like this rangefinder simply have the lens in front of the film with shutter in between, but you'll never know exactly what's going to end up on the film. In order to frame a picture, you have a separate viewfinder, which uh, it's fine, but you'll always have some parallax error between them. And then to get your picture in focus, well, that's why you have the rangefinder mechanism. This camera has a fixed lens, but with rangefinders in general, if you wanted to change the lens, really that meant changing the viewfinder. And usually that just meant drawing frame lines within the viewfinder, but some lenses came with goggles that would sit over the viewfinder and expand the field of view. At the other end of the scale, if you've ever used, or seen someone use, a large format camera, you can probably guess that they're the most impractical kind of camera, but they also give you the most control. Every time I've ever used a large format camera, it's been a fantastic experience. It really makes you feel like you can control everything. With large format cameras, you always know exactly what will end up on the film because you set up your shot with a ground glass. You take the back of the camera off and you mount a ground glass where the film would be. It's just a piece of glass with a texture on it that scatters light. You lock the shutter open, the image is projected onto the ground glass, and you get a real-time preview of what the photo will be. It's very dim, which is why you need the hood to block out other light. But once you've got your image framed and in focus, you can then close the shutter, remove the ground glass, mount the film back, double check the shutter really is closed, then remove the dark slide in front of the film, and then finally you can expose your picture. If you do everything right, the picture matches the preview exactly. SLR, single lens reflex, is a way to automate that process. Instead of hot swapping the ground glass and the film, they're both fixed in place with a mirror behind the lens that redirects the light. When you take a picture, the mirror moves. So now we're clear on how an SLR works, let's take a look at how the F3 does it. Let's start by removing the back. This is normally how you'd load the film. The back on the F3 is fully removable because one of the accessories I don't have is the bulk film back, which would let you load a hundred feet of film. The film is pulled across these rails and it's held in place by the pressure plate here. The horizontal focal plane shutter is made of titanium foil and the wind-on lever both cocks the shutter and advances the film with the sprockets. Of course, since this is the F3, where you can uh, choose not to advance the film if you want, with this multiple exposure lever, with that we can cock the shutter without the uh, film advancing. 
we had the motor drive accessory, it would connect on the base here and there, which would just drive the wind-on lever for us. The viewfinder is a pentaprism, and underneath it is the focusing screen. And we can see on that focusing screen exactly what the camera sees. All the pentaprism does is reflect that image in such a way that it's the right way up when viewed from this direction. If you just put a mirror there, it would be upside down. The viewfinder has a built-in shutter. And this is specifically for if you're using a self-timer or cable release in direct sunlight. Normally your face is in the way, but if direct sunlight goes into the viewfinder, well, it's not going to affect the image, but it might affect the metering. So if that's a concern, just click this down. Even a modern DSLR has something similar. On this one, there's a blanking plate that's normally kept on the strap. And that serves the same purpose. It's not quite as swish as the F3 solution, though. The pentaprism can almost be used as a really terrible loop. I don't mean optically terrible, I mean uh, whatever you're looking at has to be illuminated from behind. Any dust or dirt you get on that surface is going to be visible in the viewfinder. It won't affect the image on the film, but it will be annoying. Same as if you get any dust or dirt on the focusing screen. In comparison, any dust or dirt you get on the lens, well, that will affect the image, but it'll be so out of focus that uh, the effect is extremely minor. Okay, the exception to that is bokeh. Uh, if you are focusing close and you have points of light in the background, these become what are called the circle of confusion. And if you think about the optics, each of those circles is, in effect, uh, an image of the aperture of the lens. So any dust or dirt on the lens will directly show up there. I have another viewfinder here. This is the waist level finder. And I like this one because there's virtually no optics in it. In an era before, you know, digital articulated screens, being able to change the direction of the viewfinder was kind of a novelty. As I say, there's no optics in it, but uh, if you do want to hold it up to your eye, it does have this little pop-out close-up lens. If we take out the focusing screen, we can see that it is just a ground glass. And the bit in the middle is the split prism, which is to aid with focusing. And the main variation between different focusing screens is just different types of split prism. I've never fully gotten my head around how the split prism works optically. But they're very useful. I wish my DSLR had one. I have a few different focusing screens. As I say, it's mostly a gimmick, but this one has no split prism at all. And I believe the very earliest types of focusing screens really were just glass that had been sanded. But in this era, the focusing screens have a special texture on them, which maximizes the light scattering in the right direction. With the focusing screen removed, we can now see the mirror. Now if I take off the lens, you can see the mirror better. Ordinarily, light through the lens is reflected onto the focusing screen and is seen through the viewfinder. And when you take a picture, the mirror moves out of the way. And that's the main idea of an SLR. But there are a lot of subtle problems involved in making this work. So let's dig deeper. Looking at the lens, this is a prime lens. It means it has a fixed focal length. It doesn't zoom for 50 millimeters. 
It also has the simplest focus system. As I turn the focal ring, the entire lens assembly moves in and out as one unit. None of the bits of glass move relative to each other. It is made of multiple bits of glass, multiple elements, but that's only to correct for optical aberrations. The most famous example is the achromatic doublet. Dispersion means that the focal length of a simple lens is a function of wavelength. Blue light focuses closer than red light. But if you have two lenses of a different refractive index, called crown glass and flint glass, and you make a converging lens with one and a diverging lens with the other, it will partially correct for this effect. In a first order correction, the focal length as a function of wavelength changes from a straight line into a parabola, bringing two wavelengths into perfect focus. With more elements and more types of glass, you can do higher order corrections. This lens also has an anti-reflective coating. That's the purple tinge you can see in the reflections. There's a thin layer on the front, again in a different refractive index, of exactly a quarter wavelength, so giving you two reflections that destructively interfere. But because you can only target a single wavelength, and this lens only has a single layer of anti-reflective coating, it targets the middle of the visible spectrum, so reflections at the extremes of red and blue can still be seen. Here's a wide-angle lens. This is a 28mm, and again, this is a prime lens that has the whole assembly move in and out as you focus. However, the distance from the lens mount flange to the film plane, which is marked by that symbol there, that distance is something like 46 millimeters, which is obviously longer than the 28 millimeters of this lens. And this is one of the disadvantages of an SLR, is that that mirror is always in the way. So they have to add additional optics onto a wide angle lens in order to project the image further back. These extra elements not only make it more expensive, but more glass means more aberrations, which then have to be corrected for. Technically, this assembly is known as a reverse telephoto setup, because the definition of a telephoto lens is a, a lens assembly which is shorter physically than its own focal length. And what we've got here is kind of the opposite. I have here a couple of modern ultra-wide lenses. This one zooms to 11 millimeters, and this one's a fisheye at 8 millimeters. And both of these lenses use aspherical optics. Aspherical. And what that means is that using computers and uh, robotically controlled lens grinding, they've produced glass elements with a special curvature that essentially allows you to do magic. This sort of thing was not possible back in the 70s, at least not in the way that could be mass produced. So to mount a fisheye or ultra-wide lens to the F3, it has a mirror lock-up mode. Using this lever, we can lock the mirror up, and now you can mount a lens to it, which protrudes right into the camera body, right up to the shutter if it needs to. The viewfinder doesn't work in this mode, but if you're shooting a fisheye, the viewfinder isn't that important anyway. With the mirror locked up, we can now see the shutter from this side. And if we put the camera into time or bulb mode, we can lock the shutter open. And now there's basically nothing to it. Just have to resist the urge to put your finger in there as you release the shutter. Going back to the lens, we have an aperture ring which adjusts the iris. And this lets you reduce the amount of light and also increases the depth of field. It also improves the image quality a bit because most of the aberrations, particularly things like spherical aberrations, are more pronounced at the edges of the glass. Stopping down the aperture will usually improve the image sharpness. But in some situations that's less important than getting the most amount of light or getting the shallowest depth of field. If you stop all the way down, 
then the image quality degrades again due to diffraction. And this is the same reason that a pinhole camera never has good image quality. Light passing through a small gap, or even just past an edge, will diffract. Diffraction is always present, but it only becomes dominant at the smallest apertures. Diffraction is the same reason we get starbursts. If you take a photo of the sun, light diffracts around the aperture blades and leaves a mark on the image. If the iris is perfectly circular, it just has a uniform haze. But if the aperture blades are straight, it leads to these starbursts. Nikon lenses have a distinct starburst because they have seven straight blades, which leads to a 14-point starburst. Lenses with six blades have a six-point starburst. It's only the odd-numbered aperture blades that give you this double starburst. We adjust the aperture using this ring, but there's also this spring-loaded part here. The reason for this is that if we stop the aperture down, the camera's viewfinder would get very dark. At f22, you wouldn't be able to see anything. So when you mount the lens to the camera, it holds the sleever in such a way that the aperture stays wide open. You can then select the aperture that you want, and it's only when you press the shutter button that the camera releases the lever, it jumps to the selected aperture, the picture is taken, and then it jumps back. We can see the lever on the camera body that does this, and we can activate it using the depth of field preview button. On later cameras, the depth of field preview button is electronic, it has to be because they slightly change how the aperture is controlled, but here it really is just a physical button that moves the lever. When you take a picture, the lever goes down, the mirror goes up, the shutter is fired, the mirror comes back down again, and the lever is released. All mechanical, all within a few milliseconds. Well, actually the shutter timing on this camera is electronic. The timing of the shutter is controlled by a quartz crystal and an electromagnet, but because it was newfangled and untrusted, they also added a mechanical shutter release. That's, that's here. And this means you've got a, a fixed shutter speed of 1 60th, but you can, it means you can use the camera without any batteries. The aperture numbers are written on the lens twice. The big numbers are for us to see looking at the lens, and the smaller numbers are to be seen through the viewfinder. There's a cutout here, and the viewfinder contains a kind of periscope that lets you see what the selected aperture is. The metering system also needs to know what the aperture is, and that's done through a coupling on the lens mount. There's, there's a cutout on the lens which transfers the aperture number to this ring here. As you rotate this internally, it's pulling on a tiny tungsten wire. But here's a detail that sets the F3 apart. Some of the older lenses, you know, from the 1950s, were built before this system was invented, and they would not be able to mount onto the camera with that coupling in place. So in order to maintain backwards compatibility, there's a tiny button there press and fold the aperture coupling out of the way. That is what you call commitment and attention to detail. Let's talk about metering. One of the most important things in photography is getting the right amount of light on your film or digital sensor. Too much or too little and your picture won't come out. We call it overexposed or underexposed. The amount of light that reaches the film is primarily controlled by the shutter speed and the aperture. And the amount of light you want to reach the film is controlled by its sensitivity, called the film speed, or ISO number, or ASA. The units we use are called stops, or EV stops. Increasing the exposure by one stop means you have doubled the amount of light and uh, decreasing it by one stop means you've halved the amount of light, and so on. It's easy to forget, because our eyes adjust automatically, just how much of a difference there is between a bright sunny day and being indoors in the evening. It can be more than 10 stops, which is a very big difference. 
using stops does make it easier to manage things. If I reduce the aperture by two stops, then I know I need to increase the shutter speed by two stops to get the same amount of light. On old cameras, or even modern land cameras, there's often no electronics at all, and you would need to work out the exposure by hand, either using a handheld light meter or just a rule of thumb, like Sunny 16. However, most cameras have a light meter built in. A lot of SLR cameras had a needle. Uh, the light sensor basically had a VU meter in the viewport, with the needle moving as the light level changed. And through a mechanical system of strings and levers, there would be a second needle that represented the sum total of the aperture, shutter speed, and the film speed dials. To take a picture, you'd adjust those dials until the two needles lined up, and then you'd know the picture would be correctly exposed. But the F3 doesn't have needles. Uh, the big green capital A uh, means aperture priority automatic exposure. I set the film speed dial, and I choose the aperture, and the camera automatically selects the shutter speed to give the correct exposure. In the viewfinder, there's this very early LCD display of what the shutter speed will be. The next question is, how does the F3 measure the light level? Some cheap cameras would have a selenium light sensor on the body. I mean, the Olympus has something like that. The light sensor is there. And kind of hilariously, as I rotate the shutter speed dial, it exposes more of the light sensor. But that's a bad solution, because it's not measuring the light that's going through the lens. Uh, some SLR cameras had uh, light sensors mounted onto the pentaprism. And I'm not sure what the compromises were there exactly, but the F3 certainly isn't doing that. There's no, there's no electronics in the pentaprism here. The F3 offers center-weighted metering with exposure lock. The exposure lock button is here, and the way you'd use it is you'd point the camera at the subject, hold the exposure lock button, and then you can frame the picture, potentially with the subject, off-center, and still get it exposed correctly. The trick to this center-weighted metering is that the mirror is not all that it seems. If you look carefully at the mirror, you can see there's a kind of keyhole-shaped pattern on it, and that area is half-silvered. If we lift the mirror slowly, you can see there is a second mirror just behind it. And in the lowered position, that mirror sends part of the light down into the base of the camera. With the shutter open, you can see in the base of the camera there, that assembly, that is the light sensor. This arrangement is still used even on modern DSLRs. Um, you can't see it so easily, but if I lift the mirror with my finger, don't try this at home, you can see there is a second mirror behind it. And that mirror sends part of the light into the base. And in the base is not just a series of light sensors for the matrix metering, but also the phase detect autofocus system. Uh, up until the last few years, this was the really big selling point of a DSLR. The fact that the autofocus was decoupled from the image sensor meant you could have a really good autofocus that was just impossible on the uh, early mirrorless and compact cameras. We have since invented on-image sensor phase detect autofocus. This, um, this Sony camera has it, and I have no idea how it works, but it is awesome. And in a way, it's the final nail in the coffin for the SLR. But back to the F3. That sensor in the base also enables one of the most ridiculous features of all. TTL OTF flash metering. Flash photography is difficult to get right. If you think of a flash unit as a point source of light, then the illumination is going to depend on the distance to the subject with an inverse square law. 
Most old flash units had a dial on the back, which was just a mechanical calculator that could help you work out the correct exposure. This rangefinder has an interesting way of dealing with the problem. You can put it into flash mode, and that mechanically couples the focus ring to the aperture. So as you focus on the subject, that sets the distance, and the aperture is automatically adjusted to compensate for the reduction in light level. It's a bit tricky to set up, but it does work. However, it's not really metering the flash, and it will never work with, say, bounce flash. The way digital cameras do it is usually with a pre-flash. When you take a picture, it has two flashes. The first one is used just to measure the light levels, and then the second flash is fired after the shutter is opened, with the brightness adjusted based on the first measurement. It mostly works, but the double flash can be annoying. Um, on my camera, I've set up one of the buttons to be flash exposure lock, which manually triggers the pre-flash in advance of taking the picture. But the F3 doesn't do either of these things. Instead, it does a true measurement of the flash exposure, even with the flash off axis or pointed at the ceiling. I have here a flash unit, which I got new old stock for an incredibly low price, mostly because it has the stupid proprietary flash shoe that only fits the F3. When you take a picture, the shutter opens and the flash starts to fire. The mirror has moved out of the way, which means that the light sensor in the base is now pointing at the film plane. The light entering the camera hits the film and a portion of it is reflected, scattered by the film itself, and some of that hits the light sensor. There's a capacitor that integrates the reading and when it reaches the correct exposure, it sends a signal to quench the flash bulb. TTL OTF means through the lens, off the film, flash metering. It's ridiculous, I say. Ridiculous. I think that's about all I can fit into this video. There are other accessories I don't have, such as the motor drive, which lets you take pictures at some crazy high frame rate. There's also a microscope viewfinder that lets you focus with incredible accuracy. I love this camera so much. In fact, I have two of them. Despite the fact that the Nikon F3 has a reputation for being a good substitute for a hammer, this first one got damaged and the cost of repairing it was more than just the cost of a new F3. I love the wear patterns, showing the brass. I wish cameras today were made of brass. And it's crazy to think that all this was designed with pen and paper, no computers. When I tried to repair it, I found the service manual, and there's an exploded diagram in there. I liked it so much, I printed it out as a poster and put it on my wall. Something I haven't talked about is the chemistry of film photography. It's very satisfying to develop your own film, both in a dark room and in your kitchen sink. It's especially satisfying to use an enlarger to do big prints. And the way it works is fascinating, particularly colour film, which I have developed in a dark room. You have to carefully control the temperature. Or even more interesting is colour slide film, like Velvia, where you end up with a full colour positive image on the film. I suppose the ultimate progression is Polaroid instant film, where you end up with a full colour positive image developed on the spot. The engineering that went into making that happen is non-trivial. To conclude, the F3 is an amazing camera, and let's finish off with some high-speed footage of SLR camera shutters firing.